Welcome. Uh, I'd like to thank Totango for the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Ed Powers. I'm from Colorado. So first off, I do not have any pot with me. <laughs> so please stop asking. Uh, I'm going to be talking about building science, using science to build trusting relationships and reduce churn. Uh, I have a company that I founded called Service Excellence Partners. We consult with cloud computing companies to reduce customer churn in three major areas. One, to diagnose customer churn. Most people don't know what's causing their churn, surprisingly. Uh, improve quality and value of products and services. And then also to strengthen customer relationships systematically. So let's talk about relationships. What I'd like you to do is to close your eyes for a minute. And I'd like you to recall a good friend. And I'd like for you to put that person's face in your mind for a second. Does everybody have someone in mind? OK, show of hands. How many of you would say when you met this person for the very first time, you really clicked, you really hit it off with them? Raise your hands. Great. How many of you would say when you, in the early stages of this relationship with this person, you had a lot of opportunity to interact with them? Maybe you were roommates in college, maybe you were on a sports team, but you had a lot of chances to interact. Raise your hands. Great. Now, how many of you would say that as you interacted with this person, you found that your relationship got stronger and deeper, and you found that you could talk to them about just about anything? Raise your hands. Great. Now, how many of you would say you trust this person? Great. Isn't that interesting? We all have a very common human experience. We've all built trusting relationships before. Well, psychologists tell us that relationship is a process. It has a beginning, a middle, and sometimes an end. The beginning part of the relationship is called initiation. This is where we meet someone, we start to get to know them, that relationship strengthens and deepens. Then the next phase is maintenance. We stay in touch with this person maybe over months or years or possibly over a whole lifetime. And the last phase is dissolution. Sometimes we have relationships that break apart. There's a falling out. Maybe our lives grow in different directions. Now, that's very interesting. There are two things to keep in mind when you talk about a process. The very first thing in a process is that there is a sequence of events that occur. The second thing about a process is that it obeys the laws of cause and effect. We all meet people every day. We don't necessarily hit it off, right? We don't necessarily become friends. So the laws of cause and effect apply. Well, that's very interesting. Now, as, as we uh, talk about customer success and the predominant conventional wisdom in customer success goes something like this. Focus on usage, right? If you get customers using your product, they'll see value in your product. And because they see value in your product, then they become loyal to you. They churn less. Now, that makes all the sense in the world, right? And there's actually some evidence that supports this assertion. But if you look at the research, there's actually more to it than that. Certainly, the product matters. Satisfied customers aren't necessarily loyal, but loyal customers are almost always satisfied. So the product does matter. People need to, the product itself has to have intrinsic value, and people need to experience that value. So yes, usage matters. But there's also market factors, market forces here. How replaceable are you? What are the costs and risks of switching to someone else? This is also a major driver in loyalty. Some of you have software that is buried down deep in your customer's applications. You're down in their plumbing. You're hard to unseat. Some of you are at companies that have software that no one else has. That's great. That gives you a market advantage. Enjoy that while it lasts, because it will not last forever. And this last thing is relationship. What kind of relationship do you have with your customers? Is it a good relationship, a bad relationship, or is there no relationship at all? This is the area that's most often overlooked by tech companies, in my experience. And some of you are actually pursuing a zero touch strategy. How many are doing that? Raise your hand, zero touch. Nobody, that's interesting. For those who are pursuing zero touch, zero touch does not mean zero relationship. Zero relationship is a problem. That's gonna cause problems for you. So if you have zero touch, you have to work even harder at building relationships. 
Then there's this thing called trust, which is really interesting. Trust is a major moderator of customer loyalty, as the research says. The more people trust you, the more loyal they are. When people have high trust, the researchers say you have something called effective commitment, meaning they're doing business with you because they know, like, and trust you. When it's time for renewal, it's an automatic. It's a no-brainer. Is it that time again? Here's my check. You want to set up a demo for a new product? Easy. Next Tuesday at 10 is wide open for me. You want to get a referral? Let me make that introduction. So when you have people that trust you a lot, you have effective commitment, it's a no-brainer. On the other hand, if people don't trust you very much, then people revert to what's called calculative commitment. When the renewal comes up, they have to stop and think about that. They do an RFP, they do a Google search, they put together a decision matrix, they weigh their options. They burn a lot more cognitive cycles trying to figure that out. Now what's also interesting about trust is that the more people trust you, the more they're willing to overlook shortcomings in these three areas. For example, you release a new software version, it's buggier than usual. If customers trust you, they say, hey, that's okay, we know software is really complicated, these things happen. If they trust you and they call in your tech center and they don't really have a good experience, they say, well, that person must have been new. And if there's a new competitor that arrives on the scene uh, promising to disrupt you, if a customer trusts you, they will say, well, let's just wait and see. We're not in any hurry. So high levels of trust actually prevent churn from happening. Well, that's really interesting. So what is trust? The researchers say these things. Trust factors are ability, benevolence, and integrity. Ability is competence, predictability, and consistency. Benevolence is caring, goodwill, empathy, and commitment to shared goals. And integrity is fairness, objectivity, honesty, and open communication. Now, as you look at those words, what jumps out at you? Integrity, what else? Consistency, what grabs you there? More about relationship factors, right. Does anybody see up there words that correspond to defect-free software, that suggest defect-free software? Is there anything up there that suggests high-quality customer support? Is there anything up there that suggests company terms and conditions? You seeing where we're going with this? That's fairness. It takes the whole organization to earn the customer's trust. It's not just customer success. The whole organization has to build trust. CSM certainly play a role, but the whole company does as well. So trust is earned by the corporation. Now what's interesting is that trust is also learned. People learn to trust. We all learn to trust each other. We learn to trust technology. We learn to trust brands. And it turns out that we learn to trust in much the same way that we learn to hit a fastball, the way that we learn to use a new piece of software, the way we learn to play a new musical instrument. Now the brain activates different centers to do that, but the underlying neurobiology is all the same. So let's test your knowledge about the learning process. Let's take a little quiz. True or false? Learning occurs in a single experience. If you believe that's true, raise your hand. If you believe that's false, raise your hand. Smart bunch, that is the correct answer. Learning requires reinforcement. In order for you to learn something, your neurons have to fire over and over and over again. And that changes the chemical, uh, the chemistry in the, in the uh, connections between your neurons and the synapses. So you require reinforcement to learn anything. Now, we all knew this, right? But how many times do, after we hang up the phone with a customer during an onboarding session, we're frustrated that they don't know how to use the product, right? How many times do we send people to a training class and we're frustrated they don't translate that to their jobs? It requires reinforcement. You have to apply that reinforcement. So we all know it, we just don't do it, right? Okay, how about this? First impressions linger, true or false? Raise your hand if you believe that's true. Raise your hand if you believe that's false. Boy, 100% here, smart group. First impressions do linger. Now there's two phenomena that apply here. One is something called anchoring. It turns out the human brain is very susceptible to suggestion during novel situations. We grab at whatever information is available to us and we make a quick decision. 
we make uh, a judgment, we make an expectation based upon whatever information is available to us at the time. The second major phenomenon is something called confirmation bias. How many of you have heard of confirmation bias before? Does anybody know what that is? Anyone want to volunteer what that is? That's right. You notice information that supports your beliefs and you ignore information that contradicts your beliefs. We all do this. This is what humans do. If we notice something, we, we store that away. If it's not consistent with what we believe or expect, we ignore it. That's how we do things. Okay, last one. Once a belief is formed, it's easy to change, true or false. Raise your hand if you believe that's true. Raise your hand if you believe that's false. We have the brightest group in the world out here. That's exactly right. Hardest thing to, work, to change is a belief once it's been formed. This is called expectation latency. This is something that settles over time. People rarely, once they believe something, go back and challenge those beliefs. Some people are willing to die for those beliefs. So you better believe that, they're, that it's important. Now, to visualize what goes on, this is actually how people learn. There's been some experiments on this, and they've actually measured trust behaviors to see how people learn to trust each other. And it looks like this. Uh, you have, through the process of reinforcement, you start to learn to trust somebody, you have high trust, or you have low trust. And towards the end, it tends to settle. It tends to settle in on a trust value that you have in a relationship. Okay? And then there's also this very critical early front part of this called initial trust, when things are kind of cast in jello, when the people are deciding whether or not to trust you, typically on the very first encounter they have. So what this means is that first impressions really, really matter. And we all have a process, and at the end of the day, we settle in on how much we trust somebody. Which one of those lines do you think will churn more often? The red one or the green one? Which one will churn more? The red, yeah. The green is less likely to. Well, that's great. Well, how do we apply this? How do we use this in a business environment? How many of you have done customer journey mapping? OK, for those not familiar, what you do is you first define what the customer life cycle is from their perspective. This is an example. Your mileage may vary. Recognize that you have a problem. Investigate solutions that are on the market. Decide what you're going to buy. Go ahead and purchase it. Do the transaction. Implement that. <clears throat> learn it. Use it, hopefully, for a good long time. And then terminate your contract at the end of that relationship. And then what you do <clears throat> is you apply your business processes, your user experience against that. You look for points that, that involve friction, where there's disconnects, where there's frustration. And then you go about and you solve those problems. So this has been around for a long time. It's a time-honored technique. Well, what if we did something like this? What is that? Where have you seen that before? It's relationship. It's the relationship process. If we were to align and support people's natural process of building trust, won't we build stronger relationships? It's cause and effect, right? That's what a process is. This is something I call mindful customer experience design. It's a little different. Here we look at what is not only effective, but also what is effective. Effective means it solves problems, it delivers value, it serves that customer. Effective means it builds strong relationships. So what if we did both at the same time? That's this concept. How many of you are married? Raise your hand. Let me give you a great example here. I've been married over 20 years. One of the great learnings about marriage is that you can't change your partner, right? <laughs> they are who they are. You got to love them for who they are. Now that said, if there is a behavior in the marriage that causes you pain, what do you do about that? Who do you change? You change yourself, right? You don't change the other person. If you change yourself, you change your own attitudes, your own beliefs, your own behaviors, your own habits. When you do that, you change your spouse. Why? Because they're in a dance with you. They're in the marriage dance. If you introduce a new step, your partner is going to introduce a new step to compensate for that. It's the same thing in business, right? You can't change your customers. Your customers are who they are. If there is a painful or bad behavior in that relationship, in other words, that they churn, then who do you change? 
You gotta change yourself. You gotta change your own behaviors, your own processes. Now this requires something called mindfulness. Mindfulness means you are unusually aware. You're paying very close attention to what your behaviors do and how they influence someone else. But you have to know the process and you have to know your role in it. And if you know that, that's the first step to changing it. That's being mindful. And most of the time, we completely forget about our customers' trust learning process. That's a huge opportunity. We just go and do what we do. We're not mindful of what's happening in the background. We're not mindful of their normal process. OK, so you may interact hundreds of times or thousands with your customers during their subscription periods. It turns out there's five interactions, five moments that really, really matter in building trust. And they are connection, moments of connection, building relationships through commonality, moments of power, increasing mastery, autonomy, and choice. We have moments of proof, showing that you keep your promises. Moments of wow, surprise, and delight. And moments of truth when you show character when you really need to. Customers uh, know that you're there for them when they need you the most. These are the moments that really cause high trust. We don't have time in 20 minutes to get into these in a whole lot of detail. But what I'd like to do is focus on the first one, moments of connection. How many of you do onboarding? OK, this is onboarding. If you Google onboarding, this is what you get. <laughs> this is one of the clean images, by the way. Okay? So this is onboarding. In a former life, I actually bought a lot of software. I ran IT and operations for multiple startups. So I was dealing with CSMs all the time. I bought from, from HubSpot, from Salesforce, from NetSuite, from DocuSign, from Rackspace, you name it. B bought from a lot of different CSMs. And what struck me in all those occurrences is that it was a training exercise. And that's OK, but I always thought, boy, that's a huge missed opportunity. Well, what if you thought about this in terms of a moment of connection to build a relationship through commonality? What if you did something like this? Rather than jump right into training, start with what's effective and what's effective. Effective. I noticed you live in Denver. Whereabouts? Hey, my sister lives out there. You, are you a Broncos fan, too? What got you into this industry? Connect with people personally first. We do this naturally all the time. We go to a party, what do we talk about? We meet someone for the first time, what are we saying? What do we say? What's your name? Where do you live? What do you do for a living, right? It's part of getting acquainted. When we get into a business environment, we tend to forget about all that. We think that that small talk is unproductive. As it turns out, it is really productive. The subconscious mind is always protecting us. It is always aware. It is always looking for threats. When we meet someone, the subconscious is always trying to figure out, is this person a friend or a foe? Part of small talk is making the subconscious mind feel comfortable. You're safe, right? That's a signal that's under the surface. Their subconscious is trying to figure out, are you friend or are you foe? So taking a few extra minutes just to connect with them personally makes a huge difference. Then connect with them professionally. Can you tell me a little bit more about your business? What problem are you trying to solve? How do you define success? We need to do this kind of stuff. We all know we need to do this kind of stuff. Then get to your training. This is a small change. This is changing your agenda for your onboarding sessions. A very small tweak that makes a huge difference. You start building trust from the outset. OK? So leave the software training to item number three on your agenda. Here's another thought. Take a look at your communication cadence. There are three options up here, A, B, and C. The cadence are things like email, phone calls, webinars. It's all the same. All three of these, exactly the same tactics, cost the same amount of money to do, consume the same amount of resources, take the same amount of time to produce. So A is a regular cadence, right, every month or something. B, it's more front-loaded towards the subscription. C is more backloaded towards the renewal. Based upon what we're talking about, which one do you think is more effective in building strong, trusting relationships? A, B, or C? How many, how many say A? How many say B? How many say C? The answer is B. 
The answer is B. Why is that? That's right. This is the time when you're building trust. Remember the curve? It's softest. People are figuring that out at the very front of that relationship. You want to support that. You want to align and support that. You need to give plenty of contact here. If you do it more here, you don't have to do so much down there. Here's a very interesting thing about high performance. You do not achieve high performance by detecting problems and fixing them downstream. You achieve high performance by design. You understand the cause and effect relationships and you prevent problems from occurring downstream. This is being proactive. This is being reactive. There are people who get this confused. They say health scores, pick up the phone, call those at-risk customers. Yes, do what you got to do. But that's not being proactive. That's being reactive. If you understand the process, you can control the outcomes. Does that make sense? So look at your cadence. Last item, faces. Really interesting thing about us humans. It turns out that we decide whether or not we're going to trust somebody very, very quickly, the very first time we see them. In fact, in as short as 150 milliseconds, we decide if we're going to trust somebody based upon their appearance alone. 150 milliseconds is two to three times faster than you can blink your eye. The subconscious has already made a decision whether or not to trust somebody. People that we see as attractive and smiling, the subconscious says you can trust that person. If we see someone who is unattractive and frowny, we say you can't trust that person. The subconscious already makes up, it, up its mind. It anchors that whole relationship from appearance alone. Now think about that. That makes no logical sense. Makes no sense whatsoever. But that's what we do. The neuropsychologists have seen that in brain imaging. In 150 milliseconds, we make that determination. And we've been doing that for at least 100,000 years. That's part of our evolutionary biology. If that's how we're wired, why not use that, right? Put faces on everything. Put faces on your website. Put faces in your email signature lines, right? Just takes a minute to do that. Put faces in your chat sessions. This is a company out of Boulder called Snap Engage. You can put the little picture of the person chatting in there. Put pictures on your webinars, your web conferencing. Now keep in mind, it's not important that you see your customer. It's important that your customer sees you, right? So if they aren't showing their video, don't turn yours off. Keep yours on because they're starting to connect with you, OK? YouTube, how many of you have support videos, right? What do you see in a support video? Cursor moving around on a screen, you know, some narration. Why not turn the camera around and show the person who's delivering that training, right? Easy, quick fix. And then what about this? There's a company in Colorado Springs called BombBomb. Bomb. They do video uh, marketing, really powerful stuff. Great story on this. I have a good friend of mine who's a professor of marketing at Colorado State University. He teaches in the graduate school business program. And he does, it's part of a, a distance learning program that they have at CSU for MBAs. And he'll teach to a class of about 40 people. There's cameras all over the room, there's microphones. And uh, he'll talk, he'll have 40 in the classroom and about 400 folks that are remote at that time. And what happens at CSU and other universities is that they invite graduates to come in for commencement uh, ceremonies, right? So all these folks come in. And Doug tells me, without fail, every single graduation, there are people that come up to him and say, Dr. Hoffman, I really enjoyed your class. They talk to him like they've known him for years. He has absolutely no idea who these people are. Absolutely no idea. And he's got to piece it together and say, oh, yeah, you're in my remote section. So if a college professor can bond and build trusting relationships with 400 people in the audience every 16 weeks by accident, there's got to be a way we can leverage that for customer success, right? Think about that. Think about the power of video. So that's something to, to uh, consider. So three practical takeaways from my talk today, moments of connection. Number one, make training item number three in your call agenda. Simple little fix. 
This is a small adjustment that pays huge dividends. Number two, front load your cadence, right? They're learning to trust you, S serve that, satisfy that, make them successful doing that. And then add faces, this is so easy to do. And it works because the science is there, it shows it works, that's how we think, that's how we build trust. Okay, so you may say to me, well, we do all this stuff, what's the big deal? Um, the question I would have for you is, do you do it with every customer, every time, uh, every day? Because if you're not, you're probably not moving the needle very much. You have to make this systematic. And by systematic, I mean, do you use an approach that is well-ordered, is it repeatable, and it uses data and information so learning is possible? That's what systematic means. If you have a process that's systematic, guess what? You create an organizational habit. This is just the way everybody does stuff, right? It becomes second nature. Everybody just does this, builds trust and relationship all the time. It's a no-brainer, okay? So what I do with clients is we blend in these five critical moments. We make sure that's systematic at the right time, at the right place in that process to build those strong relationships. Now, um, we didn't have a whole lot of time today to get into a whole lot. I'm almost up with my, uh, with my 20 minutes. But uh, if you, this is something that really interests you, what I'd like you to do is send me a quick email. I have a white paper that accompanies this talk, Applying the Science of Trust in Customer Success Management. It's free. If you want to, just send me an email, ed at separtners.com. S stands for service. E stands for excellence hyphen partners.com. Be happy to send this to you. This digs into more of the science behind all of this. Really fascinating stuff. You find out that loyalty is really about dopamine accumulation in the brain, which is really weird. But uh, there is some hard science behind all this. Just send me an email. You know you're going to forget, so do it right now. Pull out your phone. It's free. There's no obligation. It's going fast. Act now. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's it. Any questions? I would say you deal with that the same way that you have to repair a, a personal relationship that's broken. And people will respond to that, is to say, you know, I'm, I'm concerned about how things are. I'd like to sit down with you. I'd like to explore this with you. And people are willing to do that. People are willing to give folks the benefit of the doubt, and you repair it like you would a, a, a personal relationship. People don't want to close the door on people. Uh, one of the interesting things about trust and um, about uh, expectation latency is something called loss aversion. It's actually in this white paper. People would far better fix, they would prefer to fix a bad relationship than to quit and use that to your advantage. Other questions? Well, okay. Thank you very much. Have a good conference.